uh, bring greetings from the Duke, uh, Duke Cancer Institute and the Duke Prostate Center. Uh, we are still sticking with the basketball theme, uh, at least for another year at least. And um, these are my disclosures over the last three years. Uh, similar to what Dr. Sweeney said, I guess I'm an equal, oppor and what, e equal opportunist. And uh, the outline is uh, just a little bit about PSA. Although we've covered this, I'll go through this very quickly. The uh, biology of exosomes, the test itself, uh, what we're starting at Duke University in a summary. So I think we've heard a lot about PSA, the poor specificity, it's not prostate cancer specific. And uh, boy, didn't the US Preventative Services Task Force bash PSA over a period of about six or seven years. I'm gonna talk about it at the end, but uh, gosh, we have a whole generation of primary care physicians who knew nothing, you know, basically abandoned prostate cancer screening. And we have a generation of younger PCPs who have no idea how to do a digital rectal exam. So I'm sure the urologist in the audience uh, can attest to that. But we know about the D recommendation and now the C recommendation over the last year or two for a uh, subgroup of men 55 to 69. You know, what is the proper cut point? You see on this slide anywhere from 1.5 to 10. We had some papers on the danger zone, and we know from long-term epidemiologic studies that men who come into the system with a PSA greater than 1.5 do have a greater risk of prostate cancer over the long haul, but obviously how do you apply that in clinical practice is another matter. The uh, plethora of things we can use to, to try to improve on PSA, age-specific PSA. Um, our group was very fortunate to work with um, looking at African-American men and, and um, uh, ethnicity or race-adjusted PSA. We did that work at Walter Reed, published in the 90s, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, PSA velocity and density, et cetera. And uh, I think that um, uh, Matt Cooperberg from UCSF may be the first to coin this phrase as far as the wild west of biomarkers and where certainly there's a lot of controversy with regard to tissue, blood, urine, and uh, multi-parametric MRI. And if you look out here in the lobby with all the posters, it's just amazing to see all the work being done in this area. As far as biomarkers, we can certainly use blood, urine, blood and urine, uh, tissue, and then radiomics with multi-parametric MRI. Uh, MRI. The challenges, as we all know, are trying to reduce the quote unquote unnecessary biopsies and to try to enrich the pool of men who have clinically relevant prostate cancer. And I would say, you know, now being a full time clinician in the trenches at a major academic center uh, with a whole host of primary care physicians, you know, trying to funnel these patients into urology. It's, uh, we definitely need some help because uh, it's very expensive to have all these patients come to see a urologist for a rectal exam. It, wouldn't be, it would be great to have some additional tests that we can employ out to the primary care community. Now, as far as exosomes, I will be the first to admit that I am not an expert in this area. I'm a clinical urologist basically trying to do a better job of screening my patients with prostate cancer and uh, dealing with our workload. So I'm just going to go through the basics. And we heard a lot about Dr. Nanis, they have a great talk on the liquid biopsy, biopsy approach, the pros and cons in the area where this is being started to be used. With regard to exosomes, uh, these are released by all living cells into the biofluids. They are produced by uh, eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. They certainly play a role in health and disease. They can deliver uh, molecules not normally secreted from the cells. And I love the next slide um, because uh, I am on Twitter, and I think this is a great analogy perhaps to think of these exosomes, these little blurbs that come out of the cells as tweets. And um, when you think about it, that's a wonderful analogy and um, trying to figure out, you know, use those tweets and bunch them in ways that we can sort out different diseases. The interest in the field has grown rapidly. You see this timeline from 1980 through present and the increasing number of publications on exosomes in, in various fields and in, as well as in oncology. Uh, I think the key teaching point uh, for the clinicians in the room is that uh, the 
RNA that is encased in the exosomes is very stable. So it's stable for years when frozen, stable for days at room temperature, and can survive three freeze-thaw cycles. So in the trenches when you're dealing with a urine sample and you're trying to get meaningful, meaningful molecular information from that sample, certainly the exosome, uh, testing exosomes would appear to make sense. And these exosomes can contain uh, RNA, proteins, DNA. They're, the RNA is highly stable and so certainly we can understand that perhaps in the future as time moves on that these could be exploited in medical care for diagnostics. This is a busy slide and just shows some of the applications. Uh, suffice it to say that there's a lot of work being done not only in oncology but in other areas of medicine and I think I'll leave it at that. And then getting into the test, um, it's ExoDX uh, prostate in Telescore, and that's where the that's where the um, the EPI test comes from. Exo prostate in Telescore. So this is a urine-based liquid biopsy test, and this is the workflow or how it. And first, I want to basically give the intended use because it's really important for clinical care. The EPI risk score is used to risk stratify the likelihood of high grade, meaning Gleason grade group two or greater, uh, prostate cancer uh, when in men 50 years of age and older with a PSA between two and 10. So if you're gonna use this test, this is the intended use. This is where the, the, the studies have been shown it to uh, be useful, uh, but this would be where it would be essentially uh, as a drug FDA indicated. The workflow is a urine sample, uh, exosomal RNA extraction. It's a, a, a competitive RT-PCR analysis of three genes, PCA3, uh, SPG, uh, uh, SPDEF, and e ERG. Uh, it, it, it's pl placed into an algorithm, and then we get the result. This is what the report looks like, and I've had the as I'll mention at the end, I've had the opportunity, I think we've done about 120 of these tests so far as part of our pilot uh, that we're gonna be rolling out into a bigger study. But this is what the report looks like. And you get a, a, a score, and as we'll see a little bit later, the cut point is about 15, 16 as to the risk of the patient harboring higher grade prostate cancer. Uh, and like any of these other molecular tests, and I know many of the clinicians in the room have used, whether it be, uh, you know, Prolaris, Oncotype, Decipher, et cetera, part of the art of medicine is actually going through this report with a patient. And it's basically, it's a skill set in and of itself, just going through all these uh, tests and trying to help patients make a decision. Nevertheless, this is what the report looks like. Uh, Background on some of the some of the peer review papers, uh, JAMA Oncology, the first validation study that was published in JAMA Oncology in July 2016, and the second validation study published in European Urology in September 2018. So I'll show some data from both of those validation papers. So if we look at the first and second validation studies, the overall cohort size was 1,022 patients median age of 63, median PSA of 5.3, about 15.5% were African American and about 18% had a family history. So this is, would be typical of many practices throughout the country. And again, the EPI cut point that was used for this, this, these two trials was 15.6, meaning in a group of patients who had not had a prior prostate biopsy and the intended use PSA 2 to 10, uh, this was the cut point that was, that was uh, validated. The prevalence of high-grade prostate cancer in this cohort was about 30%. About 23% of patients had a biopsy avoided. Sensitiv specif sensitivity was 92.5. Specificity was 30. Negative predictive value, 90.4. And these are the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the curves, and the comparison is uh, some of the risk group calculators, PCPT and the ERSPC uh, calculators, and then PSA alone, with the green being the EPI score. 
And this is a, a, a worthwhile slide to dissect a, a bit. So again, using the epi cut point less than 15.6 versus greater than 15.6, uh, we can see that overall uh, the high-grade prostate cancer prevalence was 30%. And let's just focus on the patients who would have a negative test. Out of a total of 239 patients, only 23 had a Gleason score greater than or equal to 7 uh, versus uh, 216 who had a, Gleason, a negative biopsy or Gleason score of equal to 6. And you see the corresponding sensitivities and specificity. So really the test, the clinical value in my mind is as a, as a negative predictive value. If a patient has the low cut point below 15.6, perhaps with, we would be able to employ this out to primary care and those patients may not need as aggressive a workup or even referral. And this is a nice slide showing, you know, the epi scores from 0 to 10, 10 to 20, so forth. And this is the percentage chance of Gleason gray group greater than 1. So what we're looking at here is Gleason 3 plus 4 equals 7 or greater in this cohort of, uh, again, over the, the patients of um, multiple trials, a, a, a nice trend upward. And here, primarily when you're down, again, the, the cut point in the validation study was 15.6, but even down here into the 0 to 10, uh, the risk of high-grade prostate cancer was certainly less than 10%. And then this is just looking at the further about a performance in a series of patients who had already had a negative biopsy. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but basically, they, in this cohort, looking at a, perhaps a different cut point for patients who had a prior negative biopsy, and that's, in this study, it was 29.5. However, again, this is, this is preliminary. This is not in the label. This is not yet a cut point for clinical use, but this just shows that further work trying to see if this could be helpful in a patient with a second biopsy. We've done about 120 cases at Duke, and it's a pilot. Um, Duke Urology and the Duke Cancer Institute, we've really tried to we've create a, a good working relationship with our primary care network, which is actually uh, hundreds of physicians who are in the Duke primary care network, trying to be, take this issue on and be proactive and, and reteach them about PSA, reteach them about screening. So our goal was, is to use the EPI test uh, in the future in our primary care network. But this first group of patients, and we're working on the data now and hopefully put an AUA abstract in, is um, on more than 120 patients. And um, looking at this very similar to what was in the validation cohort. But the basis. Um, this is going to form the basis for a formal collaboration between the Duke Cancer Institute and Duke Primary Care. Because, as I said earlier, we have a current younger generation of primary care physicians who do not know how to use PSA and do not know how to do a digital rectal exam. Now, you could argue whether PSA is, quote, unquote, any good, but I think we would all agree an experienced urologist being able to assess the prostate size by digital rectal exam is important and a primary care physician who just uses a PSA in a vacuum with no other information is, you know, not ideal, yet it's not objective either. So again, we're, we're going to employ the EPI test after proper training to, to select a Duke primary care physicians to help risk stratify men for uro, uro, urology referral and obviously tracking our results uh, for future publication. And again, considering our population in eastern North Carolina is up to 50% African American in certain communities, this is going to be another emphasis of our work. So in summary, the uh, role of exosomal RNA signatures as molecular diagnostic liquid biopsy biomarkers, that's what the EPI test is. It's been uh, validated in two prospective U.S. studies. It is included in the 2019 NCCN guidelines for early detection of prostate cancer, both for initial and prior negative biopsies. I think we were surprised, or I think they were surprised that it was included also for prior negative biopsies. Um, positive, there's a um, positive draft LCD for Medicare coverage. 
Uh, prospective clinical utility study is ongoing, and as I mentioned, our Duke Cancer Institute uh, primary care initiative is, is ongoing as well. Thank you very much. I'd like to also thank uh, Granham, my good friend Granham Sent for helping uh, put this together. Uh, Dr. Skog, who is the uh, basically the founder and the person behind this technology, and my nurse uh, pr nurse practitioner Kelly, who's actually my uh, project manager for this. So thank you very much.